Hello Internet, welcome to my channel. I'm Chameleon X, and this video is going to be a bit different from my usual stuff. I'm still working on more videos about my Fallout D&D adventure, including a synopsis of the first two sessions I've run with my homebrew rules. However, if you've been keeping up to date with Dungeons & Dragons this past month, you'll no doubt have seen the official announcement of 1D&D, the beginning of the official playtest for Edition 5.5. I, like most of you, was a bit skeptical about some of the proposed changes. Well, one of my players let me know that he wasn't going to make it to the session that week, so instead of continuing without him, and because I'd just dropped $70 on the Spelljammer box set the week before, I decided, you know what, let's just run through the light of Xerixis, except using the new 1 D&D playtest rules. So that's what we did. Everyone made 5th level characters. Two of my players, who are brothers in real life, decided to both play a plasmoid named Grombombular. They were once a single individual, but for unspecified reasons, they were split into two. The barbarian Grombombular the Mighty, and the wizard Grombombular the Wondrous. My fiancé dusted off one of her characters from a previous campaign, an Azamar paladin of vengeance named Ariel, and leveled her up to five. The last member of the party was a divine soul sorcerer, he was originally going to be a Simic hybrid, but I remarked over Discord that it would have been cool if we had a furry in the group to try out the new Ardling race. Thus was born Omo the Righteous, the Celestial Adonis with the head of a rabbit. So, character building wasn't too tricky. Everyone rolled for stats and selected a background. Grombombular the Mighty was a Wild Spacer, and the Wondrous was an Astral Drifter, which gives the Magic Initiate feat. We, of course, used the 1 D&D version of this feat, allowing him to choose from the Divine spell list. Since the list in the UA only includes first level spells, we had to extrapolate a bit. I basically ruled that our arcane casters could choose any second level spell on the Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard list. The Paladin, as a Divine caster, could choose any second level Cleric or Paladin spell, as could the Sorcerer, due to the Divine Magic subclass feature. My fiancé's character was originally a noble, so we went with the version that was listed in the Unearthed Arcana, granting her the skilled feat. So we ended up with a paladin that was proficient in seven skills. I allowed her to put her plus one in strength instead of intelligence, though, since the UA also allows the option of customizing backgrounds. Omo, in fact, used a totally custom background, choosing the tough feat at first level. Overall, the merged spell lists were a pretty positive change. There was a bit of disappointment from the sorcerer when he tried to choose Eldritch Blast as a cantrip, and I had to remind him that it wasn't on the list anymore. But other than that, we really didn't have any issues. Having spell lists based on power source, if you've watched my video on 4th edition, is something I've been suggesting myself, so I'm interested in seeing how Watsi is going to handle this going forward. Luckily, nobody wanted to play an artificer or a bard, so I didn't have to wait and see how they're going to deal with arcane healers. Anyway, with character building out of the way, we began the adventure. From here on out, there will be spoilers for the Spelljammer adventure, Light of Xerixis, so if you'd like to avoid that, I'll provide a timecode here for when I start summarizing the playtest results. We started off with a bit of prologue. Omo the Righteous had been drawn to the Astral Sea by a spark of divinity within him, finding the corpse of a dead god and beginning a ritual that would allow him to contact its vestige and learn its name. He was, however, interrupted by a star moth, a spell jamming vessel used by the astral elves crashing into the god and inverting the gravity plane. This sent Omu shooting off into wild space along with the damaged star moth, which was being driven by none other than Grombombular. They were, you see, space pirates who had stolen the star moth from the astral elves. The ship was critically damaged by the pursuing elven forces who would rather destroy the ship with the pirates aboard than allow one of their vessels to fall into enemy hands. The stricken Star Moth and Omo the Righteous were drawn into a color veil at the last second, warping them into the wild space system in which the campaign actually begins. Blown out into space when the ship exploded, the trio had only a minute of oxygen left in their air bubbles, which was enough to see an armada of Star Moths around a distant blue planet dispersing something into the atmosphere. The group then passed out, awaking on the open sea aboard a large galleon under the command of Captain Elaine Sartell. Sartell told them that her men had found them adrift and dragged them on board. When asked where they were, she told them that the ship, named the Moon Dancer, was heading to a nearby port town, Bykos, in the kingdom of Etheria. This drew a chuckle from my players, as this was a location from a previous campaign we'd run, DM'd by the player of the wizard. 
My character in that campaign actually became the ruler of Bycost during the epilogue, and when they arrived, I described the flags flying across the city, which bore a wolf head surrounded by blue roses. This was the family crest of my character and my fiancés, who had fallen in love and gotten married in that campaign, hence uniting their noble houses as one. Anyway, as adventurers lost in a strange land, they did what comes naturally to all adventurers and found the nearest tavern. There, Grombombular reasoned that they might need some extra help if they were going to get home to the Astral Sea and escape the wrath of the elves. As such, they hired Omo the Righteous as their minion, and then looked around the tavern for anyone else who could help them. I described the bar full of sepia-toned sailors, fishermen, farmers, and other nondescript villagers, and also a stunningly beautiful woman with silver hair and plate armor who was like a foot taller than everyone else and seemed to have a spotlight shining on her for some reason. The newly assembled party then asked the bartender for rumors, hear him talk about how everyone was on edge, about the strange continuous meteor showers they'd been seeing for the past few nights. They also heard a blacksmith mention how he heard a loud crash last night, and found that a crystal vine had busted through the roof of the bakery next door. It was about this time when an explosion was heard outside, and the party quickly joined the curious tavern patrons in going outside to see that just such a vine had exploded from the ground in the center of town and was already tall enough to reach past the rooftops. More explosions ring out around them, and smaller crystal vines pull themselves out of the ground and start lurching around, grabbing every anyone they can see and draining the life out of them. So the PCs spring into action. Captain Sartell, who had been at the tavern as well, says she's going to her ship. Omo and Grambambular the Wondrous decide to follow her, while Ariel stays behind to attack the Astral Blights and try to save the civilians. Omo, who took Spell Sniper at level 4, is able to help Ariel for a few turns as he's retreating toward the docks. But it isn't long before she's on her own. Luckily, Azamar have resistance to radiant damage, and Astral Blights deal mostly radiant damage with ongoing cold, so she's able to tank most of the damage. It's also helpful that the Blights target civilians first and ignore the players unless attacked, which ensured that the Paladin was pretty much able to take on each opponent one by one, and her greatsword was enough to shave half of their health off in one hit pretty consistently. Now you may be wondering, what about Grumbombular the Mighty? Well, friends, this ambitious little space pirate sees a beanstalk made out of glowing crystal, the size of a skyscraper, and his first thought is, I'm gonna steal it! He's not called Grombombular the Clever, after all. So, he rushes up to the vine and qu quickly checks it out. I describe how it's continuing to grow larger and wider as he watches, that pulses of heat and light are shooting up from deep under the earth and traveling up the trunk toward the leaves high above. So, first he tries to chop a bit of the vine off. Seeing that attacking it is worthless, he then takes the next logical step and starts climbing up the vine. I call for athletics, and he rolls over a 20. So up he goes. Meanwhile, Omo and GW reach the docks, finding it swarming with commoners trying to make it aboard one of the three ships that have yet to set sail. The largest is the Moon Dancer, which has been taken over by a red-haired crime boss and his ten thugs, who are beating people back with clubs. Captain Sartell explains that she'll take everyone aboard if the party helps her reclaim her ship. So Omo picks her up, uses the dash action to double his speed, and then uses the Ardling Racial Power Angelic Flight to gain a fly speed for that turn using it to fly Sartell directly onto the Moon Dancer's deck. The crime boss, Travis, orders six of his thugs to attack, while the rest keep loading the Moon Dancer with a bunch of cargo Travis isn't willing to leave behind. They do so, launching attacks with their crossbows and dealing a significant amount of damage to the Ardling. Next up is Grombombular. His spellbook is a pouch full of stones engraved with his arcane formulae, which he stores literally inside himself when he isn't using them. He proceeds to pull one out and cast Hypnotic Pattern. Five of the six thugs fail their wisdom save. GW, a divination wizard, uses a portent to replace number six's roll with a natural one. In one turn, all of Travis's men are stuck staring at the pretty lights, unable to do anything. Wizards, everyone. Captain Sartell and Travis then begin to fight on the deck, with Omo providing support with Guiding Bolt and Cantrips. The two of them are dual wielders, so we all imagine a fairly cinematic fight. The wizard comes up again and decides to use Scorching Ray. Even though he misses one of his shots, the other two deal enough damage to count, and with Omu and the captain rolling hot, Travis drops next turn, and I describe how Sartell cuts off his hand and then scissors its head off with her dual blades. The thugs, thus snapping out of their stupor, are overrun by the crowd, or else just jump off the docks and try to swim to safety. 
Ariel, by this point, has killed around eight or so blights single-handed and is starting to realize that this might not be a fight she can win. Even with Radiant Resistance, she's starting to look a bit rough, and I basically tell her that all the civilians in this area are either dead or have fled deeper into the city. So, bringing down one more blight for good measure, she reluctantly begins to retreat toward the docks. GM is still climbing the vine and has gotten about 45 feet up now. I tell him to roll a deck save, which he of course passes, as a tremor threatens to shake him off. I tell him that, that as the vine continues growing, it's becoming increasingly hard to find handholds to keep going, and that it seems to be growing faster than he can climb. So, eventually he takes the hint that he's not going to be able to get to the top of this thing, so he jumps off the tree, taking 5d6 falling damage, and says he's putting all his stuff in his bag of holding and setting it on the ground. As I'm about to ask why, he then leans in and gives me a grin as insane as his character. If I can't get to the top, I'll get to the bottom! You see, dear listeners, if you weren't aware, plasmoids are sentient oozes that have the ability to form their gelatinous body into a vaguely humanoid shape so they can hold weapons and use other equipment. However, a plasmoid that is not wearing or carrying anything has the amorphous trait, meaning they can slorp their way through any gap that is at least an inch wide. Glombombular the Mighty is going to ooze down into the ground, into the crack between the expanding vine and the ground it's pushing out of the way. Taking a breath, I give the universal DM warning of, are you sure you want to do that? He is fully aware of what my question truly means, but grinning even wider, he rejects my unspoken offer of mercy and replies, I'm still going to do it. I allowed him to do so, and when his next turn started, I asked for a constitution save. He succeeded, taking only half of the 3d6 bludgeoning damage I decided to roll. You see, I had mentioned before that the crystal vine was growing wider as it was taller, pushing rock and debris out of the way as it expanded. So what happened when he oozed into the hole was that he quickly found himself being crushed between the vine and the rock as the former continued to push outward. I described to him that being right next to the crystal vine, he could more or less see down through it, and thus could see that the pulses of light coming up from below originated a very, very long way down. Finally deciding to abandon his quest to steal the giant planet-destroying vine, Glombombular used all his movement to exit the ground and began running for the water. The city was beginning to collapse at this point, and I described buildings crumbling and more vines exploding from the ground as Ariel bolted through the streets, barely staying ahead of the swath of destruction. Captain Sartell loaded the civilians onto the ship and was preparing to set sail. Just before reaching the docks, I described a chasm opening in front of the Azamar, blocking her path. Omo, seeing this, threw a rope, which Ariel grabbed, and she was hoisted aboard the Moon Dancer just as it shoved off, making for open water. Grombombular the Mighty grabbed his bag of holding and rammed to the water's edge, for you see, he had one more bit of shenanigans to play. Plasmoids can hold their breath for up to an hour, and bags of holding contain enough air for a medium creature to survive for ten minutes. GM proceeded to slorp his way into the bag of holding, extruding a single pseudopod from the bag's mouth to paddle out to sea. Once the Moon Dancer had pulled away from the docks, the players could see dozens of massive crystal vines breaking free across the countryside and hundreds of astral blights roaming the lands in search of victims. Captain Sartell stomps her foot on the deck and yells to someone unseen to take us up. The ship rises into the air, slowly leaving the planet behind. Luckily for the brothers Grombombular, the wizard manages to spot his compatriot paddling away and the Barbarian is saved just in time. With 60 civilians and the entire party, the Moon Dancer ascends into wild space. Now that the immediate danger has passed, Captain Sartell explains that they will set course for a nearby space station, the Rock of Brawl. There, the party might be able to find an answer to the strange crystal vines that are even now spreading and coiling around the planet, visible now even from orbit. The Grombombulars are undaunted happy to be both reunited as well as back to wild space where they are at home. Omo the Righteous expends his remaining spell slots, healing whatever bumps, bruises, and other minor injuries the civilians aboard have sustained, and the party settles in for the several-day journey to this rock of brawl. Sartell estimates it will take six days to reach it, which might be a problem because with so many people aboard, the Moon Dancer's supplies of food and fresh water may not hold out long enough. In an attempt to alleviate the problem, as well as pass the time, the party takes a short rest while engaging in a friendly space fishing competition. Grombombular the Mighty comes out on top, as he is the only one who catches something that is at least edible. I then note that this whole time the Moon Dancer has been cruising along at what is essentially warp speed. 
However, just as they are wrapping out their fishing expedition, the party notices a soft lurching as the space galleon drops to impulse. Captain Sartell emerges from her quarters to see why they suddenly slowed down, whereupon the ship's spelljammer, a flump named Flapjack, broadcasts a telepathic warning that they have company. Rapidly gaining on the ship from starboard is a star moth, its wings the same luminous crystal as the vines that are entangling the world they just left. The civilians are hurried below decks as the party prepares for battle. Captain Sartell warns that the new moon dancer's proton torpedo launcher was destroyed in a previous engagement, and she wasn't able to get it fixed before all this happened. As such, the only ship-to-ship -ship weapons they have available are the twin laser cannons on the forecastle. The Star Moth, called the Dark Star, approaches to within 800 feet before it begins opening fire with its own proton torpedoes, scoring a few direct hits and a handful of near misses as the Moon Dancer races to close the gap so it can engage with its lasers. Volunteers from the commoners on board help Glombombular the Mighty and Ariel to man the cannons while the Wondrous and Omu prepare their spells for when they get within range. Omo, with his spell sniper, is the first to get a shot off, blasting one of the deck apes manning the enemy's proton torpedo launcher. This gives them a precious few seconds to get within range of the Moon Dancer's cannons, which begin firing away. The Star Moth takes some hits, but returns fire. The torpedo launcher is manned again by reinforcements from the Dark Star's Hadozi mercenaries and scores another hit. But a fireball from Grombombular the Wondrous sends five charred monkey corpses spinning through wild space. The Dark Star no longer has enough crew to fire torpedoes, so their only option is a boarding run. This is exactly what Ariel has been waiting for. She charges and leaps off the deck of the Moon Dancer, easily clearing the gap and landing on the enemy ship. One of the Astral Elves steps forward to challenge her in melee while the other two open fire with their laser pistols, scoring a few hits against Omo and the Glombombulars. Omo is starting to look ragged, and having used his spell slots to heal civilians, he is forced to burn his sorcery point to create one last first-level slot. The Captain of the Dark Star haughtily steps forward and demands the Moon Dancer surrender to the Xerxian Empire and promises mercy for those who lay down their arms. In response, Glombombular the Mighty aims the laser cannon directly at him and nearly takes the man's head off. The other Astra Ulf picks off a few of the commoners helping man the cannons. Since each cannon requires three crew to man, this effectively disables it. But the Mighty is unfazed, for this is exactly what he was planning. Drawing his axe, he boards the Dark Star with his companion, the Paladin, and together they begin cleaving through the captain and his lieutenant. Omo uses his last spell slot for a guiding bolt, and while the wizard deals only minor damage with a poorly aimed scorching ray, the embattled captain orders his second lieutenant, who has thus far not been harmed, to go warn Altura to withdraw. He makes a run for it, but Omo once again uses the dash action and angelic flight to rocket across the gap, landing directly behind the fleeing elf. Ariel and the Glombombulars cleave the captain and lieutenant into bloody ribbons, and then both warriors use their movement to close in for the kill. The final astral elf, Jalen, kicks the door open and screams, Altura, we're overrun! Escape and alert the commander! Go now! Just as his warning is uttered, the man is struck down by the confined fury of Ariel and Grombombular the Mighty, at which point Omo turns his palm to the remaining deck apes, urging them to surrender. Three of them are panicking and shrieking in monkey noises, <laughs> while the fourth stands resolute and folds his arms. Yeah, fine, it'll pay us enough for this shit. Thus, the Moon Dancer gains four new crew members, and the Dark Star is ransacked. The party finds the Star Moth empty except for a few provisions, which all told should give them enough rations to last the trip to the Rock of Brawl, barring any more problems. However, the mysterious Altura, presumably the Dark Star's spell jammer, is nowhere to be found. The party is forced to conclude that she was able to use magic to escape the ship, and is likely going to obey the lieutenant's last order to report this incident to her superiors. Knowing the Dark Star is more of a liability than a prize at this point, this party steals the ship's spelljamming helm to render it inoperable, and then returns to the Moon Dancer. Filled with foreboding, they resume their journey toward the Rock of Brawl. Several days pass without incident, and Captain Sartell announces in relief that they shall soon arrive at their destination. First, however, they must navigate through a swarm of tightly packed planetary debris, presumably from an unexploded moon or some other planetoid. As they watch, Sartell sucks in breath as an ominous silhouette emerges from beneath one of the massive chunks of rock. 
It is shaped like a gigantic snail shell with an elongated prow coming off the front, tentacle-like appendages draping down from the vessel's bow. Mind flayers, the captain hisses. So that ended our first session of 1 D&D Spelljammer. Overall, we had a pretty good time. The Ardling race performed pretty much as expected, and the resistance to radiant damage really came in handy for this adventure. Even with the extra hit points from the tough feet, Omo definitely would have dropped at least once if he was taking full damage from the Blights and the Elves, all of whom deal radiant damage with their attacks. The Angelic Flight also came in handy, as you probably could tell from the story. It being limited to one turn makes it really more of a platforming tool rather than a way to bypass encounters, in my opinion. The innate spell casting also helped out as they allowed him to heal Ariel from a distance without using his spell slots, which in turn helped her hold her own against the Astral Blights. So the gigantic elephant in the room was the new rules for critical hits. I can tell you immediately that nobody in the group, myself included, enjoyed these changes. I rolled a critical hit against a player during the fight, and both the wizard and the sorcerer rolled natural 20s with their spells during the various combat encounters during this session. It was just really disappointing for all of us, especially since the wizard proceeded to deal like 6 damage with Scorching Ray after rolling a natural 20 with one of the beams. It was also demoralizing for our paladin, who did in fact score a critical hit with her greatsword twice, but by the new rules wasn't allowed to double the damage of her divine smite. I can sort of get the logic behind Watsi changing this, but I absolutely think it's a mistake, and I'm hoping all of the backlash against the idea will prompt them not to go forward with this proposed amendment to the crit rules. As for crit success and crit fails on ability checks, I don't remember that really coming up. I don't really think it's as big of a deal as the attack roll situation, as from my experience, a 1 is going to fail and a 20 is going to succeed anyway, unless the DC was unreasonably high to begin with, and if that's the case, why are you even calling for a roll? The merged spell lists, as I mentioned before, is something I have advocated for. It does open up a lot of flexibility and variety in the builds. If Watsi can ha find a way of resolving some of the niche cases this kind of a system creates, like the aforementioned Artificer and Bard, I think this is an overall positive direction for the game going forward. The way backgrounds work now is also, I think, an overall positive change. Character backgrounds in 5e were always a largely pointless flavor thing that nobody really cared about beyond level 1, but now it has more mechanical weight to it, so that's good. Plus, you can still make your own, so it pretty much completely frees up ability score distribution to allow you to build any character of any class you want, which is a direction I think D&D has been going in for over a decade now, and it's probably a good choice for the future of the game. Grappling and unarmed strikes didn't come up in our session, so I can't really speak to how well that would work in play. None of my players chose the revised PHB races for their characters, so I don't have any data on those either. As for the Spelljammer adventure itself, without going into spoilers, I'm going to say that it's not too bad so far, although I've only literally just started, so I don't have much data to work off. The only things I changed were cosmetic, really. I think it's dumb that we have literal spaceships and hippo people with guns, but the Spelljamming ships are still using ballisti and frickin' catapults in space combat. So, as you saw in the story above, I place them with laser cannons and proton torpedoes, or photon torpedoes, whichever you'd prefer. I'm also going to be replacing the Astra Elves' long swords and longbows with lightsabers and ra laser rifles in the future. The damage will be the same, it's just a visual reskin to make the tech level a bit more consistent across the board. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. If you found this interesting, please leave a like and a comment, and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more content like this. Like I said, I'm working on a synopsis of my Fallout D&D adventure, and when we get a chance to do another session of Light of Xerxes, I'll make another one of these videos if it gets good engagement. Until then, this is Chameleon X, and may the Force let you live long and prosper.